Hello and welcome. In this tutorial, we're going to talk about the IP route table and the different types of routes that we find in the IP route table. Okay, so let's get started with directly connected routes. Here's our diagram of the lab we're using for this video. And we have two routers. They're connected via a serial link. And each router is connected to a local area network. And you can see the subnet ranges used for each section. So for directly connected routes, we're talking about subnets on each of the router's interfaces. So let's look at router 1. It has two interfaces. It has one for the local area network, an Ethernet connection, and it has one for the serial line, a serial connection. Each of these interfaces will be configured with an IP address and connected to another device, as you can see in the diagram. And so, quite literally, these are directly connected. And that is simply what we mean by directly connected routes. So, in other words, there's going to be an IP address and a subnet on an interface configured on a router, and that is considered a directly connected route. Okay, so specifically in this diagram, for this local area network, we have the subnet 10.10.10.0 slash 28. This interface is going to use dot one in that subnet, and it's called Ethernet 00. This subnet here is used to number the interfaces for the T1 that connects these two routers, the serial link. On router one, that is called serial 00. And the IP address used in this subnet is dot one. On this side, which we'll see later, it's dot two. Okay, and then over here we have the same thing as on the right hand side, another subnet for the local area network. And on this ethernet interface, we use dot one in this subnet, 10.20.20.1, in order to number the interface on R2. So we're going to focus on router one and look at the directly connected subnets, directly connected routes on it. And so there are two interfaces, Ethernet 00 and Serial 00. And let's go ahead and actually jump onto the router one command line and see what they look like. Okay, router one, let's start off by looking at the interfaces on this router. So we'll issue the command show IP interface brief. And we can see our two interfaces we discussed in the diagram, Ethernet 00 and Serial 00. They each have an IP address configured, and the status and protocol are both listed as up. Now that's important. That is a prerequisite in order for a connected route to be listed in the IP route table. The interface must be up, up. Now we discuss interface status codes in detail in another video, but for now it simply means that the layer one and layer two of the interface are, are functioning properly. And that is a requirement. If either of these said down or if both said down, when we look at the IP route table, we'll notice that they will be absent. Okay, so just keep that in mind. If you never, if you don't see a directly connected subnet um, in your IP route table, check the interface status. It may not be up. Let's just take a look at the interface configs of each one of those interfaces. We'll start with Ethernet 00. As we discussed, you can see the IP address there configured, 10.10.10.1. And then let's go ahead and just take a look at Serial 00. zero and... There's a description on there. It is the serial link to router 2, and you can see the IP address, 172.161.1. Okay, so those are the directly connected interfaces. So they are up and functioning. They should be in the route table. So let's actually take a look at that route table now. The command we want to use is show IP route. And we hit enter. And so let's go through a few different things. On the top here, we have a bunch of different codes. And these codes tell you how the router learned of this route and, and how it got into the IP route table. So the very first one you can see is C for connected. And of course, we're talking about connected subnets, connected routes. So obviously, if you look down a bit here, you can see a C in front of each of the two routes we're talking about, because these are both directly connected routes. 
other ones you'll see that we're going to talk about is S for static and the default one's a little bit different we'll see that in just a second but you can see some of the uh, routing protocols RIP uh, BGP OSPF um, they're all in there there's a lot in there we won't cover them all in, in this tutorial but just keep in mind if you're curious about how a route was put into the route table look for the code on the far left side and then find what it means in the in the key on a, on the above there okay so we have our two subnets listed we have 172.161.0 is directly connected and it gives you the interface serial 00, zero. that's exactly as we discussed and also 10.10.10.0 is directly connected and it also gives you the ethernet um, 00, zero interface now above each one of these you see the actual subnet 172.160.0 slash 30 and 10.0.0.0 slash 28 so what's happening there is they're giving you the classful um, uh, subnet number so class A is the 10 dot the 172.16 is a class B um, and they're giving you the subnet mask now the reason why they're only giving you one subnet mask here is that since we, this is a very simple uh, configuration, uh, we don't, we're only using one subnet mask from each of those um, uh, classful blocks. If we were to have multiple different or variable length subnet masks, then uh, under the heading of each one, you would actually see the specific subnet mask listed. Um, so I can show you a quick example of that. By the way, if any of this sounds uh, really foreign to you, make sure to check out the videos on IP subnetting and IP address I have a loopback interface on here set up and I just I'm just going to use it to show you um, an IP address so I'll, I'll enter 10 dot um, 10 dot 20 dot one and I'll use a different subnet mask here and so now if I look at the enter the IP route table again you can see now that the classful subnet of 10.0.0.0 has its proper class A subnet mask slash 8, and then each of the different um, uh, subnets within it now actually show their proper subnet mask um, in the route table. Okay, so if you if you just see one, you're probably only using one uh, static length subnet mask. All right. So those are directly connected routes. They are configured on a router interface. The interface is up and functioning. If I were to go ahead and disconnect the interface, uh, so let's say on router one, if I disconnect the serial link, and I just did that, if we go ahead now and look at the IP route table, you'll notice that the 172.16 is now gone because if we go ahead and take a look at the interface's statuses now, look at serial 00, zero. it's down, down. So it is configured, but it's not up and functioning. And if it's not up and functioning, a directly connected route subnet does not make it into the IP route table. Okay, we're going to use the same lab setup for static routes as we did for the connected routes. So a static route is simply a route that we manually add to the routing table. Okay, so it's not a connected route, and it's not a route that we learn via a routing protocol. It's something that we actually have to jump on the router, get into configuration mode, and configure it so that the router knows about this new information. So what does that mean? Well, if we take a look at router 1 again, we know it has two connected subnets to it. We just looked at those. But let's say our PC here wants to get to this PC. Well, how does router one know about this subnet? Well, since we're not using routing protocols and we haven't done any other configurations yet, the answer is router one doesn't know about it. It will not know how to send packets there. So what we can do is we can configure a static route on router one, which says, if you're going to this subnet, send those packets out this interface and send it over to router two. That's a static route, and that is the concept behind configuring a static route. Now, there are some benefits to this. Because we're not using a routing protocol here, neither router is processing all the messages that R1 and R2 would send to each other, so they're doing less work. That's one thing. So we're saving some resources on each one. And also, because of that, because there are no messages going between the two that a, nor uh, a routing protocol would normally use, we're using up less bandwidth as well. 
However, the disadvantages are, let's say we had five more subnets over here. Well, for each one of those, if we're not using a routing protocol, we have to configure five more static routes on router one. And if this keeps growing, we have to keep doing work each time. So that means it doesn't scale very well. There's always new work to do manually. And in a very large network, it just doesn't work out well. So that's a disadvantage. It's just too much manual work. Okay? So in this instance, we're not using a routing protocol. We're going to use a static route in order to tell R1 how to get to the 10.20.20.0 slash 28 subnet. Okay, so router one, let's go ahead and first take a look at the IP route table again. Show IP route. We can confirm that we do not have a route to 10.20.20.0. So we need to configure one. Let's go ahead and do that. We'll jump into configuration mode, and the command we're going to use is a global configuration command. And it begins with IP route. The first parameter we want to input is the destination network number. So we know that is 10.20.20.0. After that, we want to go ahead and put in the destination network subnet mask. We know that's a slash 28, so we put in the subnet mask 255.255. 255.240. Okay, so that's the information. Where we're going and the subnet mask. Next, we need to tell it where to send it to. We can either use an interface here, so always go out serial 00, or we can put the IP address of router 2. We can do either one. I'm just going to go ahead and use router 2's IP address 172.16.1.2. Okay, we'll go ahead and hit enter. And now let's go ahead and jump out of configuration mode and take a look again at our IP route table. Show IP route. And now you can see on the left-hand side an S for static. And if we look at the codes above, we can confirm that S means static. And we have 10.20.20.0 via 172 161.2. So that's IP, uh, router 2's IP address. So now we have a route and it's saying, hey, if you need to go to the 10.20.20.0, send it to this particular IP address. Okay? So we know that router 2 has an interface in that in that subnet, 10.20.20.1. So we can actually test this now by using the ping utility. Let's go ahead and try to ping router 2's Ethernet interface in that subnet and we pinged it successfully. So that's it. I mean, it's a pretty simple command to use. Um, the implications can be very big depending on you know how you're using it and why you're using it. Let's take a look at the last point of will this static route always be in the route table or not? Well, when we were in configuration mode, we could have put at the end of the static route, we could have put the word permanent, but we did not. If you put the word permanent in there, it means that if you're going to send, if the, if the static route tells you to send traffic out a particular interface to reach a destination, and that interface goes down, the permanent command will say, well, keep that static route in your IP route table no matter what. That means that if you don't use the permanent command and that interface goes down, your static route will be removed from the IP route table. Okay, so for our scenario, what does that mean? Well, specifically, if the link between router 1 and router 2 goes down right now, then we no longer have a route to router 2. So that, that, def that, static, net that static route that we configured is now kind of meaningless because we can't get to router 2. So router 1 will remove the static route from the IP route table if the serial 00 interface goes down. And that's similar to the connected routes we talked about earlier, where if the connected route interface is not up up it's not put into the route table it's a similar concept here so again if we take a look at our route table we see it now I'm going to go ahead and disconnect the point-to-point -point link between router 1 and router 2 and now when we look at the IP route table again the static route should be removed from the IP route table okay so let's go ahead and take a look there and yes 
Now we only see our LAN, our local area network, our Ethernet interface on router one. And in fact, not only was the static route removed, but again, the connected subnet, the 172.16, that was also removed from the route table because that interface is down now. Okay? So keep in mind, if you, if you configure a static route and you don't see it in the IP route table, go ahead and confirm the interface or the next hop uh, that you're, you use to configure it is actually functioning properly. Okay, so that is a static route and how you configure one. Let's go ahead and, and look at the final route, which is the default route. The last one we want to cover is the default route. And a default route is used as a catch-all. Okay, so when the remote destination IP address is not in the route table, the default route will match it and, ena and enable the router to go ahead and route that packet. So essentially, a default route matches all destinations if an exact match is not found in the IP route table. So this is pretty convenient for a couple reasons. Let's take a look at our example. We talked about router 1 and we configured a static route to the 10.20 network and we said if we had five more subnets behind router 2 we'd have to configure a separate static route for each one well with the default route we can actually save ourselves a lot of time so router 1 knows about these two networks because it's connected and anything else uh, any other networks it comes across um, any other packets any other destinations it knows it doesn't have a directly connected route and since we only have one link between it and router or two, we can actually simplify life and say, look, we're going to configure one default route and it's going to point. And so anything not specifically in router one's route table is just going to be sent to router two. So because of that, this one single default route can help us get to all of these different remote destinations. Okay, so it's a very it's very convenient to use because there's only one path here between router one and router two, and we don't have to configure now all of these different static routes. All right, so let's actually jump onto router one and configure one. Okay, so on router one, let's go ahead and first confirm the IP route table. So we don't have a route to the 10.20.20.0 subnet. I went ahead and I removed what we configured earlier, the static route. So let's go ahead and configure a default route. Jump into configuration mode, and this is another global configuration command. And similar to a static route, it begins with IP route. However, the destination network and the default, uh, sorry, and the subnet mask are going to be different than what we put in earlier. Specifically, the destination network is going to be 0.0.0.0. .0, .0, .0. Now that sounds a little bit weird, but what it means is each one of those zeros means match anything, match all. So you can see if we had the destination 10.20.20.1, the router will compare the 0.0.0.0 and it'll say, yeah, match anything. So it'll match that 10.20 subnet. Okay, and so we do the same thing for the subnet mask as well, 0.0.0.0. And that is the standard uh, default route configuration. However, for the next top or the outgoing interface, we actually need to put something real. So in our case, we're going to go ahead and put router 2 again, 172.161.2. Okay, so that is a default route. And we'll enter it. And let's now go ahead and check out our IP route table. And what do we have? Well, you can see on the bottom here, we have a static route because technically speaking, this default route is a static route. We use the IP route command, but it's a special type of, of static route. And you can see there's an asterisk now in, uh, after the S. And if we look in the codes up above, that asterisk means it's a candidate for the default route, meaning this is being used for the default route, okay? Like the other static route we configured earlier, it then tells us how we need to get there. So as we configured 172.161.2, the IP of router 2 is listed. Okay, so now if we were to test again, pinging the Ethernet interface on router 2, it should work. Even though we don't have a specific route to this particular network in the route table, after the router goes through each of the matches and doesn't find one, it'll then use the default route, which is the catch-all, and route the packet. And if we test it, we can see the ping is successful, and that means that the, the static route is, in fact, working.
Another thing to point out here in our IP route table, let's go back to that, is you see here gateway of last resort is 172.161.2 to the network 0, .0, 0.0.0. That's telling us that our default route is set. Okay, the gateway of last resort is now configured. Okay, so it's a quick way to learn how the router is functioning and that's presented at the top there of the IP route table.